Good morning, New Life family. If you'd please stand right now as we begin our worship service this morning, we're going to start by singing, Come Behold the Wondrous Mystery. Worship team. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to New Life Ephraim. So glad that you're here with us here this morning. Uh, let's uh, grab our bulletins, if you would, please. I want to highlight a couple announcements for us. I'm actually going to work my way backwards in our timeline and start with uh, the latest thing I'm going to mention this morning, and that is I hope you noticed uh, last week and this week also our flyer uh, on November 26th. We look forward to having Eternity Bound with us that morning. They're going to have the service hour starting at 1030. And uh, this is the singing group of our own Brian and Jason Hempy. And uh, we look forward to that on November 26th. That would be Thanksgiving weekend. So looking forward to that. Going uh, a little bit closer to our own day today on November 18th is a big day. That's a Saturday. And we have two ministry opportunities that we're putting before the body. The first one would be in the evening in Marshalltown, if you would enjoy helping out with a holiday stroll and outreach effort there, which some of you have helped with before. You can see Paul Vanderclay about that. That's towards the bottom of your announcements. You can read about that there. Uh, before that, on the same day, over the lunch hour here at the church, we are participating in the community-wide Christmas Day, and we're turning that into an outreach effort where the gospel 
message will be shared in the story of the birth of Christ. So if you would enjoy helping with that, we're going to have games like we did last year here in the sanctuary. We're going to serve lunch to the community. Uh, so if you're interested in serving lunch or helping run a game or donating some prizes for those games, any involvement at all, you can see uh, Amy Brandt. And I believe next week we'll have a sign up starting for that. But if you know you're interested, you can uh, talk to Amy even today. And then, folks, uh, again, getting closer to uh, today's date, we are just two weeks away from our packing party of Operation Christmas Child. You can see things have happened this week. Boxes have moved. We're getting ready. And uh, Ryan, why don't we go ahead and cue up that video? Well, I'm going to start. We like to show a few videos leading up to that date. So let's watch this, and then I'll highlight just a couple of key uh, announcements about that day coming up. Thanks, Ryan. This is for a boy between 9 and 11. I'm in a place called Katakosh, just outside of Mosul. This is a, a church that was completely destroyed uh, by ISIS. As we were coming through, one of our teams uh, discovered one of the Operation Christmas Child shoe boxes. I don't know who gave it, who sent it, but uh, it touched the life of a child at one point. And of course, we ask people when they pack a box to always pray. You never know where that box will go. Where are the lost? Where are the hardest to get to people groups? Where has the gospel of Jesus not been preached and proclaimed? In Acts 13, 47, For so the Lord has commanded us, saying, I have made you a light for the Gentiles, that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. We live in a broken world, an evil world. Yet Jesus gave us orders. He said, go into the world and make disciples of all nations and baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We have a job to do. When we talk about going to the ends of the earth, we're talking about shoebox gifts that are taking the gospel to the hardest to reach areas of the world. If you want to bring hope to a broken society, it's the gospel. An Operation Christmas Child is not about passing out toys, it's about the gospel. Each kid, when they receive that box, they're going to hear the presentation of the gospel clearly. They make a decision for Christ, and then they're trained and equipped to go out and share their faith with others. And many times in areas where it's an unreached people group, the Bible tells us the time is now. We're in the South Pacific. I want to reach these islands for Christ. These are the poor areas. People don't have any hope. People don't come here. There's no tourists here, but we're going to be here. I'm right outside of Mazlan, Mexico, about six hour drive up in the mountains with Operation Christmas Child. This is where people that are brave are taking Operation Christmas Child to the ends of the earth. We need boxes that are packed by families, by churches and groups, but we also need boxes that are packed online. When you build a shoe box online, these are the boxes that give us access into hard to reach places of the world. We go at great lengths, great effort, to take these boxes to children in the most remote parts of the world. It's an incredible journey. You know, the mission of Operation Christmas Child never changes. Children are coming to Jesus. Children are coming to faith. Children are being discipled and children are taking the gospel to the ends of the earth. Children are taking the gospel to the ends of the earth. The thought struck me this morning that this coming Wednesday is our church's eight-year anniversary. Uh, eight years ago on November 1st, we had our first Sunday service. And such a key part of why uh, we were started as New Life here is, is the gospel expansion locally, right here in our community, and globally as well, and something that we have prioritized in that global gospel advancement effort is Operation Christmas Child, and we get to do that once again this year. Someone said on there, it's not about packing toys, it's about advancing the gospel, and that's, and that's why we do that uh, together here. Let me just highlight a couple of quick things, and then Jim's going to come forward. Uh, if you'll notice, this is, this is very much up to date, this flyer in your bulletin. As of just a couple days ago, 
This is an updated list of things that we are still looking for. If our time is running out here, if you would have a heart this uh, week to grab some of these or order some of these, you can see one of the ladies listed at the bottom there and just let them know that that's on your mind. Next Sunday, folks, November 5th, that's next Sunday, right at the conclusion of the service, we will move around some chairs in this room, set up tables, bring some things out, I assume, from our room over here. So if you could stick around for an extra 10, 15, 20 minutes and help with that effort, that would be greatly appreciated. And then notice, please, uh, the following Sunday then, our packing party for lunch. It is not potluck style. All the lunch will be provided for you, but we do ask that you would put your name on the sheet in the hallway so we just know how much food to get. And then the last thing I'm going to mention is please feel free to invite family and friends. If they would enjoy packing with us on November 12th, we would love to have them join us for that effort. Jim, would you come forward, please? Jim's going to lead us in scripture and prayer. Thank you, brother. Good morning, all. Glasses over there. I'm going to be in Romans chapter 12, starting in verse 9 through the end of the chapter, 20, verse 21. Talking on honoring God in our worship. Um, on love. So Romans 12, starting in verse 9. Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope. Patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with God's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. Do not, repay e do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everybody. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will, reap, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come, we come before you this morning to give you the praise and the worship that you deserve for as, for as being the, the creator, the sustainer of our world, of everything we have comes from you. Father, we're here today to worship you in a way that, that, gives, that gives you the honor, but also is, is, uh, is a light that shines to, to, the, to the community, to the world, because that's what you want us. You want us to be the light shining on the hill that the light of Christ goes through us. Father, I, I pray for the, for the churches every, 
the churches around uh, our community, our state, the country, the world, that they, that they come together as, as people who know Christ, who honor him with their lips, and in their service to their fellow, to their fellow human beings to, to share Christ. That our, that our church speaks the truth of the gospel. That, that revival comes through that. Father, I, I pray it is, it is so needed that we humble ourselves before you just, uh, just to be in your will, to do your will, and, and, and shine the light of Christ. We thank you, Father, that we, can, that we can be here, openly worship you in the name of Christ. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> All right, family, if you'd please stand to your feet once again as we sing, I'd rather have Jesus. <laughs>
Again, worship team, and thank all of you again for being with us this morning. Grab your Bibles, if you would, please, and join me in Malachi chapter 1. Malachi 1. We continue in our study of this last book of the Old Testament, which will take us right up to the Christmas season of 2023. I'd like to, uh, for you to imagine for a moment that you were given a unique invitation. I want you to imagine that you were invited to Terrace Hill. Terrace Hill is the governor's mansion, if you did not know that, in Des Moines. I want you to imagine that you were invited there to dine with the governor of Iowa. doesn't matter what the occasion is doesn't matter exactly which governor is uh, leading at the time. Just imagine this scenario is happening. You are part of a large delegation 
of citizens of Iowa, and you are dining with the governor and his or her family, and maybe their main staff people. If that happened, you would probably consider, of course, uh, what you are going to wear and what you might say and how you might conduct yourself. How should I shake their hand and how should I act, that kind of thing. You would consider how you should do your hair and perhaps what time you should arrive. You don't want to be too early and uh, you certainly don't want to be late. But now consider this. You get a phone call two weeks before the dinner and you find out that you are in charge of the meal. <laughs> what do you do? Panic. <laughs> you can't pass it off to someone else. You are absolutely in charge of what gets served that night. Anything goes, but it's up to you. What do you do? Well, some of you might be brave and actually try to make something yourself. If that's the case, no doubt you would find your very best recipe and make absolutely sure that you have the help that you need in the days leading up to it and the day of. Others of you, perhaps many of you, would not dare to try to do that yourself, and so you would start to think about something I heard someone just mention, who can cater this thing? What can I afford? Maybe some of you would do some quick fundraising to try to get the very best. Would, would Hy-Vee be good enough? Would we go to Hickory Park? Uh, do you go out and, and find the best barbecue catering in the state of Iowa? I mean, honestly, what, what, where would you go with this? Is that a Hardee's? <laughs> Jerry, I'll, I'll do that with you, Jerry. That's a good thought. Would some of you be so bold to think out of state? Uh, could we have enough money to get someone to come in from Kansas City or Chicago or the Twin Cities and, and cater this thing? What would you do if you were in charge of the dinner to be served to the governor of Iowa? It's a question and scenario that surprisingly is not too far off from the heart of our text today in the book of Malachi. Last week in our study of Malachi, we saw that there was this distinction established. God has set his merciful love, remember, on Israel and his judgment, his holy judgment on Edom. Paul uses... Some of the very words in last week's text in Romans 9 to make the point that God is still distinguishing between those who receive his salvation and his eternal judgment. Distinction established, that was last week. But now, starting in our text today, God speaks through Malachi and communicates that, listen, based on that distinction, there are expectations. If you are the distinct recipient of his merciful love, there are expectations that you live distinctly. It was true of Israel in Malachi's day. It's true of the follower of Jesus today. As a child of God, you are called to live, to dis, uh, to live a distinct life that reflects the Lord that you follow and serve. In our text today, we begin to see that God addresses these things with his people, Israel. Actually, for the next several weeks, we will be looking at some problems that God's people were having with the level of distinction in their lives. It starts today with the priests of Israel. We'll begin our study by looking at two problems that the priests were having. They had something going wrong with the offerings that they were bringing to God, and they had something wrong with their attitudes <laughs> while serving God. 
both of those having to uh, something to do with the scenario of dinner with the governor. We'll, we'll get to that. After we've looked at those problems, we'll see what the text says about God's response to all of this, and then we'll close by trying to summarize all that we've seen with three final thoughts. Before we pray, here's our main idea for the text today. I said I'm going to try to do this maybe each time. Just see it now, and then it will make more sense, I hope, as we go through our study. The supreme king deserves distinct worship and service from his people. The supreme king of the nations deserves distinct worship and service from his people. Before we pray, I want to read our text together. Maybe you will see some of those very elements in our main idea as we read through it here. Can we just do this together, and then I will pray, and then we'll dive into our study. Would you find, please, Malachi 1, 6? This is where we left off, verse 6. Let's just read it together. A son honors his father, God is saying, and a servant his master. If then I am a father, where is my honor? And if I am a master, where is my fear, says the Lord of hosts, to you, O priests, who despise my name. But you say, how have we despised your name? By offering polluted food upon my altar. But you say, how have we polluted you? by saying that the Lord's table may be despised. When you offer blind animals in sacrifice, is that not evil? And when you offer those that are lame or sick, is that not evil? Present that to your governor. Will he accept you or show you favor, says the Lord of hosts? And now entreat the favor of God that he may be gracious to us. With such a gift from your hand, will he show favor to any of you, says the Lord of hosts. Oh, that there were one among you who would shut the doors, that you may not kindle fire in my altar in vain. I have no pleasure in you, says the Lord of hosts, and I will not accept an offering from your hand. For from the rising of the sun to its setting, my name will be great among the nations." And in every place incense will be offered to my name and a pure offering. For my name will be great among the nations, says the Lord of hosts. But you profane it when you say that the Lord's table is polluted and its fruit, uh, that is, its food, may be despised. But you say, what a weariness this is, and you snort at it, says the Lord of hosts. You bring what has been taken by violence or is lame or sick, and this you bring as your offering? Shall I accept that from your hand, says the Lord? Cursed be the cheat who has a male in his flock and vows it, and yet sacrifices to the Lord what is blemished. For for I am a great king, says the Lord of hosts, and my name will be feared among the nations. Father, I love that song that we sang, I would rather have Jesus than anything this world affords. The applause of men, riches untold. I'd rather have Jesus to lead, the song sang. What what beautiful lyrics. I pray that would be our true heart posture and heart cry this morning. We thank you for our Savior, the great King of the nations. Bless our time in the study of your word in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, as we study the passage together, I'm going to sort of regroup our verses in a way that I hope will make uh, sense of the text. So we will start with the idea of the priest's problems, if you're taking notes this morning. And as you can see, We will see this in 6 through 8, but then also jump and see it in 12 through 13, all right? Make no mistake, as we dive into the text together, God begins to address through Malachi the priests of Israel, the priests. 
These are the men who made up the tribe of Levi, the priestly tribe. Aaron, Moses' brother, was the first high priest, you recall. Their job was to represent the people before God. Uh, Our Malachi, remember, is a prophet representing God to the people. This is the opposite. The priests represent the people before the Lord. They served in the temple of the Lord in Jerusalem. They accepted and offered the offerings that the people brought in worship. This is them, the priests. Now, Malachi addresses multiple problems that the priests were having. We're going to see two of them today. I'm going to propose to you that we see a third next week. If you're reading ahead, you can see if you can... Uh, find the third issue that comes after our text today. But as we read through the text today, problem one of two becomes clear. I hope you saw it. Problem one was that the priests were offering polluted offerings. See it in the text again. Look at verse 7. By offering polluted food on my altar, but you say, how have we polluted you? By saying the Lord's temple may be despised. Look at verse 8. When you offer blind animals in sacrifice, isn't that evil? And then he also lists lame and sick. And then jump down and look at verse 12. But you profane it when you say that the Lord's table is polluted, its fruit is despised. Look at the second half of verse 13. You bring what has been taken by violence or, again, lame or sick. So what's going on? Well, in the most general of terms here, the people of Israel, God's people, were commanded to worship God in this time through what? Through offerings and sacrifices. This included animals, cattle, lambs, even doves. In certain scenarios, they were commanded to bring those to the temple of God in Jerusalem and present them to the priests for them to offer as a worshipful sacrifice on their behalf. Now, that's just a very general summary of what was happening, but I also want to show you something specific. Are you ready? Take a look at the instructions from Deuteronomy 15. This is concerning the quality of animals that the people were to bring. Listen. All the firstborn males that are born of your herd and flock, are you seeing this? You shall dedicate to the Lord your God. Bring it to Jerusalem and offer it. But if it has any blemish, if it is lame or blind or has any serious blemish, whatever, You shall not sacrifice it to the Lord, your God. Pretty clear, isn't it? Just one of the sacrifices that Israel was to participate in was that each person was to bring their firstborn male lamb or cow or whatever and offer it to the Lord in worship. He is the owner of everything. He is deserving of this. However... Any blemish in that firstborn whatsoever, don't bring it. Blind, lame, any defect in any way, don't offer it. That was God's clear command, and now we can start to see, right, what is being violated here in Malachi's day. As you read, by the way, about uh, the way these sacrifices were to go down, you might just jot down uh, Leviticus 27. You don't have to turn there, but Leviticus 27 seems to make it clear that the priests were the ones who were in charge of valuing the animal that was brought, if you look at Leviticus 27. In other words, it was the priest's job to look at the animal that the person brought and say, okay, this is without blemish, we'll take it, or nope, this is blind, this is lame, this is whatever, you need to adjust accordingly. And so now I hope we are starting to see what this first problem is. In Malachi's day, the priests at the temple were clearly violating God's word, 
They were accepting polluted offering. The text says blind, lame, and sick. But would you notice, please, it also says, if you look at 13, animals taken by what? Force or violence. In other words, think about this. People were actually going around and stealing other people's cows or lambs in order to then turn around and take them to Jerusalem and say, I am offering this as mine. You talk about violating the very heart of the idea of a sacrificial offering to you, to God. Oh, let's just take Joe's cow over there and offer it for ourselves. But God here is, is confronting who? Who's, who's he confronting? He's confronting the priests. It was their job to filter out the blemished offerings, and they weren't. Their offerings were polluted. Their worship was defiled. <coughs> they were offering the very things that no one else wanted, and this is the way that they were worshiping God. Excuse me. How's the state of your worship, believer? How's the quality of your worship of the living God? These are questions that we should wrestle with from this text, and we'll return to them as we wind down this morning. That's all under problem number one. However, there's another embedded in Malachi's message. Write this down. Problem number two not only polluted offerings, but poor attitudes. Did you, did you see it? Poor attitudes. I'm feeling much, much better, by the way, and have for several days now, but still fighting a little tickle in my throat here. <clears throat> poor attitudes. This particular problem comes out of verse 13. Would you look at verse 13 again? God says through Malachi, but you say... What a weariness this is. <laughs> and you snort at it. Did that catch your attention when you read it? You snort at it, says the Lord of hosts. That idea of, of snorting at it is an interesting Hebrew word study. It's a rare word in the Old Testament, only used one other time in the book of Job. It means to sniff or blow in contempt. It's one of those words that, at least for me, immediately brings a sound to your mind. <laughs> you get the idea? That's what this word brings to mind. See the poor attitude in there? Listen, not only were the priests of God disobeying the Lord in their work by accepting polluted offerings, but in addition, they didn't even want to do their job attitude, a terrible attitude about their job. One author wrote that the priests, quote, considered their job a wearisome or a worrisome task or a nuisance. Another author wrote their job had become a bore. <laughs> can, can you picture this? They're waiting around in the temple for people to bring up their sacrifice, and they're saying, I'm, I'm so tired of this. I'm just tired of this. Day after day, we stand here and just take animals and cut them up and throw them on the fire for our portion, if you know the Old Testament uh, law, for, for our portion, we just get this tough chunk of meat to eat. They're complaining, saying these things under their breath, probably saying them to each other. For them, serving the Lord had become a wearisome burden. This is another big-time problem, isn't it, with the priests? I thought this week about how I would feel if, if I lived by then, uh, back then. You think about it. How would you feel? And I, if I was joyfully, worshipfully bringing my sacrifice to the Lord and I encountered this grumpy group of priests, <laughs> how would you feel? Can you imagine how that would affect your attitude as a worshiper? If I was feeling particularly ornery on that day, 
I might give him my animal and just kind of walk away and, and, and singing under my breath, there is joy in serving Jesus. <laughs> you remember that one? Great song. There's joy in serving Jesus as I journey on my way, joy that fills my heart with praises each hour and every day. There is joy, joy, joy in serving Jesus. Remember this? Joy that throbs within my heart. Every moment, every hour, as I draw upon his power, there is joy, joy, joy that never shall depart. If I was ornery, I'd sing that on my way out. It's what they needed reminding of. How's your attitude in serving Jesus, believer? How's your serving of the Lord? Has your serving of the Lord in the ways that you do become a wearisome burden to you? Again, we'll come back to that thought. Just kind of want to tee up those questions for us, and then we'll come back to it. However, for now, we've seen these two problems, polluted offerings, poor attitudes. Let's finish the text by looking at the grouping of verses that speak to God's response. How did he feel about all of this? He tells us. His first response comes out in 9 and 14. I'm putting 9 and 14 together. Look at 9 again. And now, still talking to the priests, and now entreat the favor of God that he may be gracious to us. With such a gift from your hands, will he show favor to any of you, says the Lord of hosts? That, that phrase, entreat the favor of God, literally means stroke the face of God. It's very interesting. It's a picture of helplessness, begging for his favor. But verse 9 says, do you think that you're going to get any favor from God by offering those blame and, uh, excuse me, blind and lame and, and, and stolen animals? The implied answer is, of course, you're not going to. What you're doing is not going to get you any favor from God. Now look at verse 14. So there's favor. Look at 14 now. Cursed be the cheat who has a male in his flock and vows it and yet sacrifices one of those blemished ones. I am a great king, says the Lord. My name will be feared. So what are these verses bringing out, 9 and 14? Are they not bringing out the reality of the favor of God and the curse of God upon his own people? Favor, verse 9, curse, verse 14. Last week, folks, we talked about God, listen, and be reminded, lovingly sparing His people from judgment, but this week we're seeing that the actions of His people still have consequences, don't they? God disciplines those He loves. Hebrews says. We're seeing that there's blessing in obedience and consequences in disobedience. We'll talk more about that next week because Malachi returns to this theme of on his own people, favor, curse, or discipline. But for now, just note it. God responds by reminding the priests of the reality of favor and Verses. But for God's second response, look at verse 10. This is a bit of a shocker. Look at verse 10. Did this raise your eyebrow? He says through Malachi, oh, that one of you would shut the doors. The doors of what? The temple. The temple. That people can't come in and make these fires and, and offer these things in vain. I have no pleasure in it, says the Lord. I will not accept these offerings from your hands. These offerings and these attitudes lead the Lord to say, you might as well shut it down. Just shut it down. Somebody, please, shut it down. Oh, that someone would shut the doors and no offerings were made anymore because I have no pleasure in what's going on. It, it's it's a, quite a statement, isn't it? And then watch what he says in verse 11. This is beautiful. And by the way, sunrise, a, a theme of this book, uh, from the rising of the sun to its setting, my name will be great among the nations. Every place incense will be offered to my name, a pure offering, for my name will be great among the nations, says the Lord of hosts. You see that same language at the end of verse 14? 
couple, two, three times in this text, we have this idea of my name will be great. I will be feared among the nations. If you're taking notes, just jot down. Uh, most believe this is the prediction that true worship and service will be seen in distant places and in distant times. It's a prediction of the worship from Gentiles, Gentiles, non-Jews. And the interesting thing is, is that when we come to chapter 3 in this book, God makes it clear that when the Messiah comes, true offerings of worship will be brought by the nations. This idea of others worshiping rightly and purely is linked in this book. Listen, to the coming of the Messiah. And we are studying this book leading into the Christmas season, the celebration of the Messiah's arrival, Jesus. And this book will show us that when Jesus came, this reality that Malachi speaks of is fulfilled. And the one verse and text I thought of was John chapter 4. Remember who Jesus speaks to there, the woman at the well. And he said, quote, the hour is coming and is now here, Jesus says, when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father is seeking such people to worship him. The sun rises, the Messiah comes, true worshipers, the hour is here, Jesus says. Not polluted offerings and bad attitudes in worship, but honoring, fearful worship. Shut the temple down. My name will be great. Don't you love that? Will be great among the nations. We've worked our way through the text together. Let's see if we can start to summarize it with some key ideas. Let me share three of them with you as we summarize and apply this text in the next few minutes together. Here's a first one. Jot this down. Let's just say the heart of the matter, the heart of the matter. When I served as a youth pastor at Marshalltown E. Free, we had a man on the elder team that, that sort of had a, a personal catchphrase that he was always saying. We'd be talking about some situation in the church involving people, and, and this man in, inevitably would... would always direct us to the following question, what is the heart issue here, he would always ask. What's the heart issue here? He'd always ask that. What, what, what's the heart issue that we're dealing with? He knew that, that the conflict or the sin or the doctrinal matter or the tension or the resistance to authority or whatever, whatever the situation was, he knew there, there was a, a deeper heart level cause and fountain for the behavioral thing. What's the heart issue here in this person? Folks, I thought of that man and, and his little go-to question this week because our problems in the text have a heart issue. Did you see it? What we've talked about so far are the presenting problems. Impure offerings, lame, blind, sick, stolen, and then poor attitudes. They complained about their service to the book. Those are the presenting problems, but would you agree there is a heart level issue underneath those? Did you see it? It's at the very beginning. <laughs> Go back to verse 6. It's at the very beginning. God leads with it. A son honors his father and a servant his master. If I'm a father, where's my honor? If I'm a master, where's my fear, says the Lord of hosts. To you priests who despise my name, but, but you say, I think in defense, how have we despised your name? The, the, the how is polluted offerings and bad attitudes. But at the heart of those 
what would you say? Lack of honor and lack of fear of God. Do you see it? Low honor, low fear of God, and out of those flows the fountain of bad offerings and bad attitudes. Listen, the heart issue underlining these actions and attitudes was their view of God. Their view of God. That's why we twice have the emphasis on God being a great king in 11 and 14. I am a great king and my name will be honored among the nations. And folks, that is why the heart issue is why we are having this interesting question in verse 8. Look at verse 8 again. I think maybe the emphasis, remember you Simeon folks, I think maybe this is the emphasis of this text, verse 8. Try acting this way before your what? Your governor. <laughs> Will he show favor to you if you're presenting these things to him and having these attitudes towards him? So, so if you won't be that way before them, why are you being that way before me? God said. If you're invited to Terrace Hill, you're not going to show up with SpaghettiOs and Kool-Aid, right? Although, by the way, I, I like those two things. But you're not, you're not going to present them to the governor. So why are you doing that to me? The great king of the nations, God said. If you're going to Terrace Hill, you're not going to serve the meal and, and, and like mutter and complain under your breath the whole time because you're afraid that the governor might hear you. So why do you do that to me, God said. That's the hard issue. Do you see it? Their view of God was lacking, and so it led to these two problems. Their fear of God and honor of God was low, and so they accepted blind cows and had poor attitude. So how's your view of God, believer, is really where we need to start. How's your view of God? Do you see him as the great king of the nations? Yes, he is our friend and savior, but he's also our Lord and king. Yes, he walks with me and talks with me, but he's also the one that we crown with many crowns. Yes, what a friend we have in Jesus, but we also fall on our faces before the glory of Jesus. How is your sense of honor towards the Lord? How is your sense of worshipful awe and fear? It's the foundation for ensuring that we're not guilty today of the same problems that the priests are displaying. Speaking of those problems, let's unpack those uh, to end this morning. I just want to un unpack each one a little bit more together. Our second summary thought is this, problem uh, dealing with the first problem that we looked at. Our great king deserves distinct offerings of worship. Our great king, that's the view we should have, deserves distinct offerings of worship. Let's go back to our main idea. Write down worship if you're taking notes, and then Ryan will go back to our main idea. Here it is. The supreme king, our view, deserves, right now, distinct worship, and then what we're getting to, and service from his people. Because of the reality that God is glorious and the supreme king of the nations, he therefore is absolutely deserving of distinct worship. When others try to cut corners... In their worship, the people of the living God do not. He is deserving of our best offerings. Now, if you're thinking critically, which I hope you are at this point, you should be asking, well, what does that look like today? Because we don't bring in a cow, do we? Or a lamb. There's no fire up here and people throwing them on there. 
Let me give you a few reminders. Revelation 5, 8 pictures the prayers of the believer going up before the Lord as a sacrificial offering. Our prayers. How's the quality of your prayer offering, believer? Romans 12, which Jim read earlier, and actually he started after this, but it's in the same chapter. Romans 12 speaks of the believer offering their bodies as a living sacrifice of worship. In other words, how we live our very lives is an act of worship to God. How is the quality of your offering in that regard? believer? Does your life, your obedience, depict an offering of worship to the glorious King of the nations? Psalm 51 speaks of the sacrifices that God desires as a broken and contrite spirit before Him. How's your attitude of brokenness and humility, believer? Finally, but Honestly, what we might think of first, Hebrews 13, speaks of the praise of our lips being sacrifices to God. It says that when the fruit of our lips acknowledge His name, that's worship, Hebrews 13. That's what we often think of first, our, our, our speech in particular, our singing on Sunday morning. And we call it these days worship. I call these people the worship team. Believer, how's the quality of your worship through your words? Is it your best or is it a sick cow? Richard Taylor, talking about our text in Malachi, applies it to the believer this way. Listen to what he writes. Authentic worship can be expressed in formal ritual as well as spontaneous acts. I think that's a really good word. And yet also either can be a sham or hypocrisy. Religious activity performed without genuine love and gratitude to God is not only useless but repulsive to Him because it slanders His character. <clears throat> Listen, please. Every believer must constantly guard against developing such a cold heart toward God that maintains the activity without the gratitude and love behind it. Do you follow? Such a loss of gratitude and delight in worship is a sign of spiritual decay that could lead to a shipwrecked life. Convicting word. What's an example of a sick cow today? Maintaining the activity without the gratitude and the love behind it. How's the quality of your offering of worship, believer, in particular regarding Sunday mornings and, and, and the fruit of praise from our lips? And I, I believe me, this convicts me as well. See God as the supreme king of the nations and our pure offering will follow. Lack honor and fear of God, and we're in danger of doing the activity, but missing the gratitude and the love behind it. Here's our third and final thought for this morning. Write this down. The great king deserves distinct worship, but now we're saying also distinct joyful service. Joyful <laughs> service. One of the problems we saw this morning is that the priests had a bad attitude about their service to the Lord. They, they sniffed and they snorted as they did their work. Think about this. They had the unique special position of serving the king of the nations in his temple. They were chosen from the other 11 tribes to be the group to serve the living God in this way. And they snorted at sniffed at it. They complained. They found it a burden. They were tired of it. 
But standing against this problem in Malachi's day are the words that Jim read earlier. Thank you, Jim. The words of Paul in Romans 12. Look at them again. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. (laughs) There's the opposite. I'm quoting it from the NIV because Pastor Charlie, when I did my internship so many years ago now, had us memorize that verse in the NIV to take with us on that mission trip. Do not be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. That word fervor is the term in the Greek that they used for water that was boiling. Listen, believer, keep your water at boiling in regards to your attitude in serving the king of the nations. It's a far cry from the picture we get from the priests in Malachi's day, right? I'll be completely honest with you. I'm being transparent this morning. I found myself sniffing and snorting this week, okay? In regards to a particular part of my role here as a pastor, I found myself literally saying out loud to myself, I don't think anybody heard me, I said, I, I am tired of this. I am tired of this. It wasn't about a person, okay? It wasn't about a problem. It was a task. It was just a task. And I literally said that uh, to myself out loud, and boom. (laughs) The Holy Spirit just said, look at what you're reading. Look at what you're studying this week. This is exactly what the priests of chapter 1 were doing. How's the quality of your service, believer? See the Lord as the great king of the nations, and your fervor is to serve him will remain at boiling. Lack fear and honor towards him and we'll find ourselves sniffing and snorting and swimming in tepid and cold water. Not boiling. He is the great king of the nations and he deserves joyful service. When you are serving the Lord in the nursery And I praise God for those of you who serve in the nursery. Thank you. When you serve the Lord in the nursery, we should not snort, but serve with joy. When you serve as an elder, our countenance should be that of feeling great honor to serve the king, not complaining. When you teach Sunday school, it should be a joy to serve the king of the nations in that way. When we pack shoeboxes, there should be no sniffing or snorting. When we provide food for the Christmas outreach or run a game or help with a holiday stroll in Marshalltown, it should be done with a mindset of fearing God and honoring Him. The ways we serve should have a mindset behind it of fear and honor of the King of the nations. How's the quality of your service? Is it being kept at boiling? Or do you find yourself snorting and sniffing? As I found myself in that place this week, I had to go back. You say, well, what do you do? I had to go back to the heart of the matter in our text. I get to do this. I get to do this for the king of the nation. I wouldn't take the governor SpaghettiOs and Kool-Aid. I wouldn't. I might have that for lunch. Sounds pretty good, but I would not take that to the governor. I would not snort and complain in the uh, presence of the governor as I give them their food. So why would I do those things for the living God of the universe? The supreme king 
deserves distinct worship and service from his people. Father, thank you for your word today as our worship team comes. I pray that uh, not just for this song, but moving forward, the fruit of our lips as we join these faithful servants who sing each week and play their instruments, that the fruit of our lips would join them in a pure offering, one that comes from a heart of gratitude and love to the King of the nations, who has made a distinction in the life of the believer and placed his loving mercy on them through Christ and not eternal judgment. The distinction that God has made through that response of repentance and faith in the life of the believer calls for distinct lives. And part of that is worship and service. So Father, thank you for this opportunity we have to sing Thank you for the opportunities we have to serve you. I pray joyfully, first and foremost, in my life and in my brothers and sisters. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. Let's stand, let's sing. Thank you, worship team. Christ,